All right. I do believe I am live on Facebook. Prof. Dave Taylor here. Going to give everybody a chance to come on. I started to come on a little bit early because I discovered that if I come on late, people think that I'm not coming. So, <laughs> yes, I'm here and I'm live on my post and really excited as my sister. Really excited about the prophetic word today, but I'm excited every Sunday because <clears throat> the thing about the word of God is that it's alive and it unfolds. And what I mean by that is, is that the word of God is ever increasing, ever expanding. It's a living thing. It's not a dead thing. It's not something that stays contained just in the way you meet it. <clears throat> so in other words, that's how you can read the same scripture literally for decades. And then one day the spirit of God gives you a new revelation on something you've been reading your whole life. And all of a sudden you see it new. All of a sudden you see it differently. Also, when God gives a prophetic word, a prophetic word expands. So in other words, whatever it is that the Lord says to you, the potential of that word is always much greater than you think it is. And so when you walk in that word and you obey that word, it expands and it unfolds and it increases. It's the most amazing thing. And, and that's something that you have to walk with God to experience. But once you do, you'll see how that works. And it's really, really something else. So <clears throat> anyway, going to give people a few more minutes to come on and I'm going to start right on time at 2.30 cause I'm a, I'm a believer starting on time. And yes, we have to pay, pray for my little cousin. Uh, we've been praying for my little cousin. She's going through some changes and some challenges. So huh. it's, it's that kind of time. It's that uh, kind of season. And you've heard me say this over and over and over again. And that is that you have to understand what kind of time and season you live in. There are times and seasons in your personal life. There are times and seasons in your family's life. There are times and seasons in your ethnic group, in your culture. There are times and seasons in the church. There are times and seasons for a region like the Midwest region of states in America. Uh, like the Far East. And then there are times and seasons globally. And so one of the advantages, one of the purposes of the prophetic word is so you can always ask God, what time is it? What season are we in? Where are we? Because you need to be able to know where you are to understand what the Lord is telling you about what to do based on where you are. And we're in a time of, of great opportunity and great destruction. We're in a time of great joy and great sorrow. We're in a time of great life potential and we're in a time of great death. And so if you want to get over on the life side, if you want to get over on the potential side, the only way to do that during this time, it's the same way all the time, but it's more pronounced and more acute and more pointed during these seasons is to get under the blood of Christ and stay under the blood. It's to get in the will of God and stay in the will of God is to get into <clears throat> obedience and stay in obedience, okay? That's the kind of time we live in. We live in that kind of time where mistakes and missteps can take you out. Getting out of the will of God can absolutely end your days early because there's a you know great path of blessing in life, but the devil is out there and death is out there like never before, okay? That's the kind of time you live in uh in america now okay it's 2 30 so we're gonna get started father in the name of jesus to come to you just thanking you for another fantastic opportunity to come before you to hear from you oh god because we want to hear what you have to say because in your words uh there is life so i praise you i worship you i magnify you i glorify you i declare you god all by yourself i honor you as god uh, in heaven you have no peer Oh God, you are God all by yourself. I extol you as being pure and your word being pure, tried like silver is tried in the furnace seven times. I give you glory and honor. So please forgive me for any, any sin. Please wash me clean right now by the blood of Jesus for any thought, word, and deed whereby I've sinned against you today. 
and fill me with the Holy Ghost of God and breathe through me. I must decrease so you can increase. So let the words be spoken, be what you want spoken. And let the prophetic teaching and, and prophetic words that come forth be what you want. So I surrender now to the Holy Ghost, let the Holy Ghost take over. And I declare and decree and establish that signs and wonders and miracles shall follow those that hear, believe, and obey this prophetic word. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Amen and amen. Now, <clears throat> today's prophetic word is champions. Today's prophetic word is champions. Have you ever longed for something? Have you ever had a dream in your heart? Have you ever looked out into the future of your life at any age and said, I might be here, but I want to be there. And not only do I want to be there, but I want to be a winner. What do you do when you have a dream that lives in here, but it's not existing out here? And what if you, what if you say not only do I want to do that which I am desirous of, but I don't want to just be a part of it. I want to be a winner in it. I want to be a champion. I want to plant my flag. I want to put my foot down. I want to make my mark. What do you do between dream and reality? What do you do between desire and realization? What do you do? All right. Well, I stopped by to tell you what the Holy Ghost wanted me to tell you about that. Because so many people, I can't tell you the number of people I've met in my days that, for example, have these great singing voices, but they're not singing professionally. Or these people that have great athletic talent, but they're not playing pro ball. Or these people that have a great desire to affect their community but they're not running for alderman or congressman or state senator or U.S. senator or anything like that. What do you do when you have that burden? And it's one of those kinds of burdens that won't let you sleep at night. Anything in your life that is casual, you can dismiss. You can just fluff it off. What do you do when you have something that has gripped your heart, gripped your spirit, gripped your inner man so tightly and so strongly until it won't allow you to sleep at night. What do you do when you say, I want to do this thing, but I don't want to do it halfway. I don't want to be half baked. Not only do I want to be a part of this mix, but I want to be a winner in this mix. And that's not the same thing. There are a whole lot of people that run the race, but ain't but one winner. There are a whole lot of people that compete for the prize. There are a whole lot of people that compete in the Olympics, but when it's time to get those medals, there's three stands on a podium. There's the gold medal winner, there's a silver medal winner, and there's the bronze medal winner. What do you do when you say, I want a medal? I want an MED, not a not medal, not interfere, not be nosy, M-E-T-T-L-E, -T -T -E, not that, but I want a medal, M-E-D-A-L. I want a medal, I don't want to halfway do it. I want to be the best of the best, okay? What do you do when you have a desire to not only be in something, but to be a winner of that something and it won't let you sleep at night? What do you do? I stopped by to tell you that today's prophetic word is for champions. The first thing you need to understand about being a champion and becoming a champion, let me put this in the chat is that you have to think like a champion. <clears throat> Step one is you have to think like a champion. You are never, ever, ever going to get to the winner's circle unless you think like people in the winner's circle. Let me say that one more time. You are never, ever, ever going to get to the winner circle unless you think like people in the winner circle. 
So under number one, think like a champion. What you're going to need is some type of mentor, some type of model, some type of example. It doesn't have to. It's, it's always better when it's one on one. Like if your dad teaches you something or if you had a really good teacher in school that you still remember, that's always better if it's done that way. But what do you do if you can't get to the people you admire? And the answer to that question is sometimes you have to have a book mentor or some, sometimes you have to have a video mentor. That means you read books about them and you read books about their life. OK, you watch videos about them and you watch videos about their lives and you might not be able to ever meet them personally or for them to take you under their wing. But by you studying what they did. It, it teaches you to develop the mindset. Uh, one of my musical champions, one of my musical models, and my son can tell you this because my son gave me his autobiography uh, one year for Father's Day. And it was the best present. It was the best present. It's Quincy Jones. And one of the reasons I love Quincy Jones so is because Quincy, Quincy Jones has just exceeded. His career is just beyond describing. And so I wanted to know how that man thought. What did he do? And one of the things that he did was he was never afraid to tackle a musical assignment. So when I got out of school, I said, whatever songwriting opportunities I get, I'm going to take them. That's why I wrote so many different kinds of things, because I wasn't afraid, because Quincy wasn't afraid. Didn't matter what style, didn't matter if it was horn parts, string parts, keyboard parts, bass parts, whatever. Quincy's like, you know, if I can't do it, I can learn it. But he never shied away from a musical challenge. So I adopted that mentality from my own career because I looked at a champion and I said, well, that champion said, whatever it is, I bet you I'm gonna write it. Or I'm gonna learn how to write it. That's what I did. That's why I've written so many different things. See what I mean? So if you don't get a chance to meet them personally, read about them, see how they think. Cause you never gonna get there unless you think like a champion. Number one, here come principle number two. Principle number two, is you have to speak like a champion. Good God Almighty, I could just stay right there. You gotta speak like a champion. Now, what I'm about to say is deeper than I have time to go into, uh, because what I'm about to say is very, it's a very, very complicated and complex subject. So I'm just telling you up front, I'm just gonna skim the surface because this subject is too deep for me to spend the whole time on it, but, when Father, Son, and Holy Ghost said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and uh, over every creepy thing that creepeth on the earth. When God said that about us as humans, what that means is that we are like him slash them. We are like the Holy Trinity. We are like that which is divine. Now, some of y'all not gonna like this next one and I don't care because I'm here to stretch your mind. See, Jesus is the king of kings. He's the big K, but we're the little K. We're the kings that he's king over. Jesus is the Lord of lords. He's the big L. And we're the little L, the Lord said he's Lord over. And Jesus is the God of gods. He's the big G, but we are the small G because that's in the scripture that we are God. Small G, not God in heaven, but small G in his image. Because of that, that means that we are speaking spirits like he slash they are like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And when God wanted something, he said it. He said four words. He said, let there be light. I want you to notice he did not say, let there be a sun. He did not say, let there be stars. He said, let there be light. That means that all the light that's in this universe came forth when the Lord said that. He then, you have to read Genesis. He then shaped it and molded it into a sun, into a moon, into stars. But remember, we're just talking about the Milky Way. There's other galaxies like Alpha Centauri. I want you to think about the sheer amount of light it takes for there to be a sun and a moon and the Milky Way and then whole other galaxies that have other suns, other moons. For example, there's about a half dozen moons around Jupiter. All that stuff is lit by light and all the stars and all the comets. And God said four words and all that light came forth. Look at that. I stopped by to tell you that that is you. What did you say, Prophet Taylor? I said, that's you. When you speak something and you believe it, when you say it, 
you take it from the invisible to the visible. Say that one more time. You take it from the invisible to the visible. And that's why you got to watch what you say. So many people keep calling what they don't want. I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples. My first example is when you're speaking to your children. If you're one of those parents that always seem like you focused on the worst in your children, you can't keep speaking to the worst in your children and think that's going to bring the best out of them. I have never understood that. I don't understand it now. Of course, your children have faults and flaws. So do you. So does every human on the planet. But if you keep speaking to the, the worst in them, that's what's going to come to the surface. You can't keep telling your kids that they're stupid and then they develop confidence in their the critical analysis skills because you kept saying they were stupid. They're not going to learn how to think their way through things if you kept saying they were stupid like that. OK, you can't call the dog when you want the cat. <laughs> OK, so uh, that's when you're doing that kind of thing. Another way that you have to learn how to speak is a lot of people that aren't winners or champions. They keep uh, saying what they have instead of saying what they want. If you keep your mind focused on just what you have, that means your resources can't grow any bigger than what you already have. What happens if you started saying what you want? What happens is you release the spiritual energy of faith and it begins to happen out here. OK, like I said, this is a very deep subject. I'm just skimming the surface of this truth. And this is why a lot of people don't understand that when you just keep cussing at something, why it gets cursed, because you kept cursing it. <laughs> That's why. OK, because uh, every time you say something, every time you release the power of your words, you bring it from the invisible to the visible, just like God, because we are like him. OK, <clears throat> again, I could spend the whole time on that, but just you need, you need to understand you're going to have to start talking like a champion. OK, you're going to have to start talking like a champion. You're going to have to start talking like a champion. And if you don't know what that sounds like, that takes you back to point one where you need a mentor. You need to find somebody that's doing what you want. You need to find somebody that's at the level you want to be at and listen to how they talk. OK. All right. <clears throat> So we're going to go to the next one. Next principle. Next principle is. You have to work like a champion. Good gravy from the Navy. You have to work like a champion. Why is that so important? Because this is the one that it seemed like that people want to throw out because people keep writing all these books about how you can speak your way into stuff and you can think your way into stuff. Thinking is right, principle one. Speaking is right, principle two. And then you've got to put some works behind your faith. You've got to work like a champion, okay? You've got to work like a champion. You've got to put the hours in. You've got to put the time in. You've got to develop your skills. You've got to develop the network. You've got to develop the knowledge. Don't you know that something you've been doing for 10 years you're better at it now than you were when you started. It doesn't matter what it is. Even something like raising kids. Everybody knows that if you have uh, sets of kids, your kids get different versions of you. If you had a set of kids when you was young in your teens and 20s, they got a certain version of you. And that version was probably too hard on them. If you had kids in your 30s and 40s, them kids grew up with a different version of you because you mellowed out a little bit and you realize maybe I should, hey, that's my cousin. And then you realize maybe I shouldn't have been so hard on them. Maybe, you know, you look at some stuff from, an old, from them older kids and you say, well, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do. And then second set of kids get a different version of you. If you have kids later in life, 50s and 60s, that's another version of you. Them kids going to get a different version of you. Do you see that? But the point I'm trying to make is that you got to put the work in. <laughs> it doesn't matter at what point you start. You're going to be better at it years down the road because you've been doing it for a while. And it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. For example, if you have been pursuing education and you keep going to class and going to class and going to class, they're going to come when you graduate. 
How can you not graduate? If you keep going to class, you keep writing the papers and passing the tests and turning those grades in, they're going to come where it's time to turn that tassel and we confer upon you the degree of whatever you went for. Also, on the flip, if you've been lying, <laughs> I'm not laughing. <laughs> if you've been lying for 10, you've been lying. You just been you just you just lying. You might be lying about everything. You might be lying about something in particular. But if you've been lying for 10 years, you're a better liar. But the day gonna come where that whole cost house of cards coming down. Because it's a lie. You see that? And so the point I'm making there is that people seem to think that you don't have to put the work in to get in the winter circle. Yes, you do. You, you say you just want somebody to open up the winter circle and let you in. Uh, let me tell you something. If that ever happened, you wouldn't be able to stay. What if they gave you a gold medal like they gave Simone Biles and they conferred upon you a gold medal for being one of the best gymnasts in the world and you can't bit more do a back bend, more or less a balance beam routine. And so somebody took you to another country and said, go on out there and make your country proud and get on the uneven bars. You'd be that he bada hobbita, he bada hobbita, because you're not a gold medal gymnast. Somebody just gave you that medal. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't mean anything because you didn't do the work. You didn't do the work to get into the winner's circle. You didn't work like a champion. That's why it's not going to mean anything. Uh, you hear me say it all the time. It's like that with money. If somebody gives you a windfall of money, it's not going to do you any good until you think like, like the level you want to be on. If you want to be a multimillionaire, you have to think like they do. Okay. If you don't learn, because you have to change, if you don't learn how to think like a multimillionaire, then somebody could give you $10 million. That $10 million in less than six months is going to come down to how you think. So if you think $10,000, that $10 million coming down to $10,000, I guarantee you. People don't believe that, but it's very, very true. Because you didn't put in the work. You didn't put in the work to take yourself from someone that thinks $10,000 to someone that thinks $10 million, because that's a different level of thinking, that level of finances. That's why, because you didn't put in the work and it doesn't matter. Uh, and what's my other favorite example is a good relationship. You always have people run around talking about how they want to be in these relationships. I stopped by to tell you, if you want a champion level relationship, you have to be a champion, champion level relator. Do you really think somebody is going to listen to you yell and scream at them for four or five years at a time? They're going to leave. How about if you worked on your communication skills and you learn how to talk, then you became a champion communicator. Now you can have a champion relationship. Now you can build a champion business network because you know how to talk to me because you put in the work to learn how to communicate better. You see that? You got to put in the work. You're not going to get to, to the winner's circle unless you put in the work. Okay. All right. So principle number one was you got to think like a champion. Principle number two is you got to speak like a champion. Principle number three, you got to work like a champion. Now we're going to go to the scripture and we're going to look at some championship situations and we're going to see what the very word of God has to say about championship everything. OK, first scripture we're going to go to is. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 41. going to go to Genesis chapter 41. Uh, I'm going to tell you the story and I'm going to read some scriptures. Because the story is quite long and uh, involved. So I'm going to give you the background and then I'm going to read some scriptures to you. Okay. The background of what's happening in Genesis 41 is Joseph, who is one of the sons of Jacob. Now, remember, you've heard me talk about Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau were the twin boys from Isaac, and Isaac was Abraham's son. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, Jacob had four wives, Rachel, Leah, Zilpah, and Bilhah, okay? Uh, he had two sons by the wife he loved, which was Rachel. Joseph was one of those sons, but he was hated by his brethren, mainly because his father favored him so. So they actually sold Joseph into slavery into Egypt. So when Joseph went to Egypt, he was a slave and a servant, and he was in and out of prison, and he went through a whole lot, and he spent years and years and years in a hole in the ground because their prison was not like our prisons. 
So the day came, but Joseph had a prophetic dream, a prophetic dream interpretation. So the day came when Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, were, was having dreams that he could not interpret. He did not understand them. And Pharaoh went to all of his people for counsel, all his people he kept around him, and they could not interpret his dreams. So one of them remembered, one of them that had been in prison with Joseph said, oh yeah, I forgot. There's this Hebrew in prison who has a dream of prophetic dream interpretation. I bet he could do it. So Pharaoh called for Joseph, okay? That's where the story is. So Pharaoh told Joseph his dreams that he had uh, a dream of seven fat cows and seven sick skinny cows. And had a dream of seven fat stalks of corn or wheat grain and seven skinny sickly stalks of corn or wheat and grain. And Joseph said, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. God is going to give Pharaoh seven years of plenty. That's the fat cows, the fat grain. And then there's going to be seven years of terrible famine. That's the sick cows and the thin grain. So Joseph said, you should set someone over your resources so that uh, we can gather up the grain during the years of plenty so we won't starve during the years of famine. Okay. And I'm going to read to you what Pharaoh said to that. Uh, actually, I'll start at verse 33 so you can read Joseph's words. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by famine. Now I'm at verse 37. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked him, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Verse 42, then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold, fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And people shouted before him, make way. Thus, he put him in charge of the whole land of, of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand nor foot in all Egypt. That was verse 44. What just happened? I'll tell you what happened. Joseph was a champion. And all the years he was hidden, God was training him. God was getting him ready for this prophetic word, God was teaching him how to move with excellence regardless of his circumstances. He was teaching him how to deal because Joseph got put in jail because of a false rape accusation. He was teaching him how to continue being excellent even when someone has completely lied on you and tried to ruin your life. He was teaching him how to be faithful and stable even in the midst of greatly unfair things. And when the time came, Joseph's preparation shook hands with opportunity. I'm going to say that one more time. Joseph's preparation shook hands with opportunity. I'm going to put that in the chat. Preparation shook hands with opportunity. Okay? A lot of people don't understand why. They keep praying to God about stuff, but they don't understand. That's because until the time comes, God has you practicing, thinking like a champion, speaking like a champion, working like a champion. But the day is going to come. The day is going to come where all that preparation you put in to become a champion is going to shake hands with an opportunity. OK, and then you're going to have a chance to shine and God is going to lift you up. It's going to be an accelerated Exaltation is going to lift you up above everybody else, sometimes in a moment of time.
Okay. Why? Because Joe Joseph had that championship training going on from the ages of, well, he started working with his father when he was a teenager, but he got his vision at 17. So from the ages of 17 to 30, that's 13 years, 13 years he was in training. And then by the time it was all over, what happened? Pharaoh put him in charge of a country. Let me ask you something right now. I know a lot of people have comments and feedbacks and criticism, criticisms for pastors of large churches. Let me ask you something. Could you pastor a large church? What if God took you from where you are right now and put you in charge of the church you go to? Could you handle that? Would you know what to do? Would you know where to start? See what I mean? Uh, we're always talking about people that are at different levels, but what about you? What about your level? Could you do that? What if God opened that door and see people that don't think like champions and people that don't speak like champions and people that don't work like champions won't even recognize the door when they see it? Haven't you ever met people and you knew them at one point in your life and you see them again many years later and they're in the same place as they were when you saw them however many years ago? You, however, should not be in the same place if you are on the path of becoming a champion. You understand that? That's why so many people don't become champions because you want it to be quick. You want it to be easy. You want it to be a genie thing where you just wave a lamp and it doesn't work that way. And it wouldn't work even if that happened because you didn't do the steps, put the time in. But when the door opened, Joseph was ready and he got put in charge of the economy of a nation, but he didn't just save Egypt. None of the other nations around Egypt, the Bible said, had corn and grain, but Egypt did because of Joseph, because that prophetic gift, that prophetic dream interpretation was sharp. Did you notice that when he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, he didn't have to hesitate? Pharaoh told him the dream and Joseph said, that's what that is, like that, okay? That's years of training to get Joseph to that level. How do we know that Joseph thought like a champion? Because he wasn't bitter and angry. He didn't get out of jail talking about, oh, they did me wrong. <laughs> he wasn't singing a they did me wrong song. He said, I got an opportunity to stand before Pharaoh. So let me shave. Let me put on some nice clothes. Let me shower. Let me shower. Get myself together. And he went out there and he did his thing. And in a moment of time, he became vice chancellor. He became administrator of a whole nation. Could you do that? What city do you live in? What if they called you tomorrow and said, we're going to put you in charge of something that's affecting the city? Could you do that? Would you know where to start? <clears throat> what if they told you, we're going to put you in charge of this area and, and everything in the city is going to live and die by your word? What would you do? See, that's how to know where you are in your championship thinking. Do you, do you know how to think that? Would you know where to start? Would you know how to get on that level? That's the kind of thing. Now, let's look at some more scriptures. Let's look at another scripture. All right, we're going to look at 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18. All right, put that in the chat on the screen. 1 Samuel 18, 1. After David had, and I'm reading out of the NIV, New International Version. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David and loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, that's talking about Goliath, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. The timbrel is a percussion instrument, a little bit like a tambourine, not quite like that. And a lyre is a little bit like a, a small harp. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now let's examine this. Let's examine this for our championship training. Okay, what did David do right? First thing David did right is that he developed a friendship with the prince. 
Saul was the king. Jonathan was Saul's son. The son of a king is a prince. And the Bible says Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as himself. You know what that means? That means that Jonathan and David became ride or die. So let me ask you, are you ride or die with any princes? Any families of power, influence, any structure of power and influence, are you ride or die with people like that? Do you have that in your life? Do you even think that way? Do you think to make friendships with people that are princes and princesses and kings and queens and bishops? Okay, do you think that way? Are you tight like that with anything? So first thing D David did was he made himself an alliance with the prince and they became ride or die. Then from that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. So Saul graduated David. The king was so pleased with David that David went to live in the palace. Now, let me tell you something. When you move from wherever you are, whatever place you are to the palace, you have to learn how the palace go. <laughs> God was training King David for later for his own kingship because David started living in the palace. Life in the palace is a little bit different than wherever you come from, unless you come from another palace. So not only did David get right or die with the prince, but David moved into the palace because he was already so good at what he did to Saul. Like, I ain't letting you go. You're a jewel. You're a treasure. And I'm going to keep you close to me. That means David got to see firsthand what life was like as a king in the palace. Uh, see, God was training him. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. Stop. What did the Bible just tell you? The Bible just told you that the prince gave signatory items to David and he gave weapons to David from Prince Jonathan himself. So he had off, uh, uh, Jonathan took off and gave David a robe and a tunic. You know what that means? That means that when David walked up and down the hallway, the robe and the tunic of the prince was on him. So everybody that saw David knew this is the prince's friend. You better not mistreat David because he and Prince Jonathan is like this because he wearing Jonathan's robe and tunic. Okay. And the Holy Ghost is telling me to tell you that God is about to redress some of y'all. The prince, the princess, the king, the queen, the bishop, the vizier, the chancellor is about to take off their robe and take off their tunic and put it on you so that when you walk around, everybody around you can see that you have the favor, the favor of the prince. They'll be able to see it visibly. And that's very, very important because people treat you differently based on who they think you are. <laughs> and people treat you differently based on how you dress. Don't tell me that's not true. Don't argue with that. People treat you differently based on who they think you are. I know you wish everybody was like God and we could just love everybody, but we don't. We're human. And people are going to treat you differently based on who they think you are. And people are going to treat you differently based on how you dress. This man, David, got signatory items from the prince, which means when you walk around the palace and you're there at the request of the king and you're wearing the robe and the tunic of the prince, it's like you're part of the royal family. They, that, that means they would have to treat David differently. Otherwise, you risk the wrath of the prince and the king. See that? But then the Bible says that Jonathan gave David his sword, his bow, and his belt. Excuse me, swords and bows are weapon, weapons. And belts are used to hold up your clothes. Belts are used to kind of fasten your armor together. Belts are used to make sure that whatever you got on is kind of stable. So David had weapons from the prince. That means when he went out to battle, when, when he drew that bow or he took out that sword, they saw it was Jonathan. So that means that David's level of somebodiness increased. And the Bible says that that pleased the troops and Saul's officers, but I'm get that in a minute. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. Do you know why David was successful? Because he already knew how to fight. And Saul and Jonathan gave him an opportunity to fight at a higher level. How do we know David knew how to fight? Because he killed the lion 
and killed a bear back when he was just tending the sheep before anybody knew who he was. There it is again. There's God's championship training that when David was on the backside of, of the grass fields, tending to the sheep, David killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands. That's why he had courage because he knew that God delivered the lion and the bear into his hands. That's what David said. That's why he had confidence to go against Goliath because it wasn't the first time in his life he'd been up against something that was bigger than him. Do you see that? So God was training him to build his faith because I wish you would try to kill a lion with your bare hands. I wish you would try to kill a bear with your bare hands. Okay, that's supernatural. David had those supernatural experiences of victory from God. So we went up when he went up against Goliath, he wasn't afraid because it wasn't his first time at the rodeo. Okay, but the Bible says here that he had signature weapons from the prince. And David was so successful that Saul lifted his rank in the army. That pleased the troops and Saul's officers as well. That means that they were happy to have a man of David's uh, wartime prowess and proficiency on their side because David had been fighting since he was young. That's how he knew how to fight when he was grown. I stopped by to tell you that the spirit of God is saying to some of you watching me live and some of you watching the replay and some of y'all that don't you know, even know that, that I'm looking at you, looking at me, because I can see you in the spirit, that God is going to take all the stuff that you've experienced and you didn't understand how you were going to it, what it was. It was training. It was training. It was training. It was training. Yeah, see, now I'm seeing some places in my mind now. I'm seeing where you're looking at me from, okay? And I'm seeing some columns and, and anyway, but um, it was training. It was training so that when God gets ready to, to, to get you around the king and the prince and they give you that grace, you'll know what to do. You can get out there and fight on a whole new level and your rank will increase. And then when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, that's Goliath, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. And as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Wait a minute. Why did they ascribe, why did they ascribe more kills to David? Because after David killed Goliath, then they all went against the rest of the Philistines and David just started taking them. They just started whopping jokers left and right. Okay, just taking them out because he wasn't afraid of a fight. He fought a lion and a bear. He fought a giant because Goliath was like nine feet tall. And then he fought a whole bunch of men and he didn't die. He killed them. How you going to be? That's melee fighting. If you don't know anything about melee fighting, how you going to be surrounded by opponents and you take them all out? That's what he did. And when you're on a battlefield, especially if you're coming, you know, straight horizontal, you're not facing people one at a time. What would you do if they surrounded you? That means you have to learn how to melee fight. OK, you got to fight more than one person at once. And David did that. You see that? You know why? Because that man was a champion. That man thought like a champion. That man spoke like a champion because when he killed Goliath, he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And this day, God's going to give you, going to give me your head and the birds, the fowl going to feast on your corpse. He said it. He spoke his victory before he ever swung uh, the stone, before he ever swung the slingshot. He said it because he spoke like a champion. That's how you know David was already a champion. And this is next level stuff. And then he fought like a champion. Do you see what I mean? That's what's got some of y'all looking at me right now. That's what God is doing in your life. You haven't understood, okay? You haven't understood. You haven't understood the pain. You haven't understood the rejection. You haven't understood the, the banding back and forth. You haven't understood why Satan came at you so hard. You haven't understood why so many people just talked about you. You haven't understood why it seemed like you had to fight and struggle in every inch of ground, every inch of ground that you gained in your life, you had to fight for it. You know why? Because God was giving you championship training. God was giving you championship training. Now I have to say this part. I'm sorry that I have to say this part because I wish I didn't have to say it. But I do have to say it, so I'm going to say it. 
some of y'all, the reason you're not getting the victory like you wanted is because you have refused the training. What does it look like when you refuse the training of God? When you hear the voice of God calling you and you reject it. Some of y'all, y'all heard God call you a long time ago and you said, nope. You said, nope, you slapped his hand away. For whatever reason, you didn't want the responsibility. You don't want to break up with your boyfriend. You don't want people to talk about you. You didn't want to stop living in what you was living in. Whatever the reason, whatever the reason. Yeah, some of y'all are going through things in your family right now because you don't have the faith to fight back the devil. Because God tried to call you to himself years ago so he could train you. Then you begin the victory right now instead of struggling. And some of y'all, that's why you're not on a championship level, because you heard the voice of God many years ago and just slapped his hand away. But today, the prophetic word is about champion. So that means you need to change that. If you feel God calling you, stop running. If you feel God calling you, stop fighting the voice of God, the hand of God, the purpose of God. Stop fighting it because he's trying to train you. So that when opportunity meets preparedness, he can lift you. God is not trying to put you down. God is not trying to pull you down. God's trying to lift you up. That's why I talk about on my Thursday broadcast about having the right concept of God. If God is calling you out of something, it's because he's trying to put you in something greater. One more time. If God is calling you out of something, it's because he's trying to bring you into something greater. And that's why a lot of people stay in bad relationships. You didn't break up with that person when the Lord told you to because you didn't believe there's somebody better out there for you. You didn't move out of state when God told you to because you didn't believe there was a better life for you in that new state. You didn't quit that job when God told you to because you didn't believe there was a better job out there for you or a career. OK, if God is calling you out of something, he's calling you into something better. But you have to know him to know that. That's why he calls us to spend time with him so we can get to know him. OK, we're going to read one more scripture and then I'll wrap up. We're going to go to Judges 15. So let me put that on the screen. We're going to go to Judges 15. There's a whole lot in this one. Well, there's a whole lot in all of them. I just don't have time to execute all of them. There's a whole lot because remember today we're talking about champions. OK, if you came on the broadcast late or if you're watching the replay, watch from the beginning. Go all the way back and watch from the beginning so you don't miss any of the principles, okay? All right, we're going to read out of Judges 15. And I'm Judges in the Old Testament. I'm reading out of the New International Version. Okay. I'm going to start with verse 9. The Philistines, which were enemies of Israel, the Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The people of Judah asked, why have you come to fight us? We have come to take Samson prisoner, the Philistines answered, to do to him as he did to us. Because Samson had just had a major, like, he took a lot of them out and he burned a lot of them too. Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? Samson answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. That's verse 12. Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson. The ropes on his arm became like charred flax, that means burnt ropes, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson, Samson said, with the donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. <laughs> with the donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramath Lehi. What did we just read? First thing that we read is you have to understand that you're going to have enemies. You might have a lot of enemies. You might have great enemies. Okay. Because it's always like that when you're a champion. Okay. 
Stop trying to avoid that. Stop trying to think there's something wrong with you or wrong with your life. Stop trying to think anything because that's a part of the game. How do we know that's true? Because God himself has enemies. Do you know who the enemies of God are? Uh, the false trinity, Satan, the anti-father, the beast, the anti-Christ, the false prophet, the anti-Holy Ghost, and sin and death and the grave and hell, poverty, sickness, and all of the demons, uh, the flesh nature, all those are God's enemies. So if God Almighty has enemies, then you will have some enemies, okay? You might have great enemies. You might have a lot of enemies. So they came down and they were gonna capture Samson and Samson's own people, 3,000 men from Judah, went to get Samson and said, you realize their rules over us, what have you done? Because they did not have a champion mentality. 3,000 men went to get Samson. How come the 3,000 men of Judah didn't go and fight the Philistines? Did you notice that? Because they didn't think like champions. That's why. They came to shut Samson up and they came to deliver him over to them. 3,000 of them. Samson said, okay, just swear you won't kill me. And, and so he did a little fake out to where he looked like, made it look like he was bound up, got near the Philistines and the Philistines started shouting. They ran at him. And then the Holy Ghost came on Samson. And Samson snapped off those restraints grabbed a fresh jawbone of a donkey and struck down a thousand men. You know what kind of stamina you have to have to fight a thousand men? You know what that would do to your arm to just keep swinging and just keep hitting a thousand people in a row? And Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. <laughs> with a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. Okay? Because the Holy Ghost came on Samson and he was walking in that anointing. And when it came time for him to show out, that championship anointing was there because Samson knew how to fight. Samson knew how to set up a situation where it looked like his enemies were going to get victory over him. And then he shouted and the Holy Ghost came and he beat, he took, he said, with a donkey's, a, a donkey, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. Look at that. God will teach you how to take something innocuous, take something in the environment, Take something that's not even an official or a typical weapon and beat your enemies back so hard until you beat them. If you beat them with the jawbone of a donkey, you done turn them into donkeys. That is championship thinking. That is championship speaking. And that is championship working. Can you see that? Okay, so let's sum up uh, so I can wrap up today's prophetic word is about champions. Okay, wait, the Holy Ghost give me something to say. So I'm saying that. Today's prophetic word is about champions. Number one, you got to think like a champion. Number two, you got to speak like a champion. Number three, you got to work like a champion. Then I give you examples from the scripture. Here comes a prophet, prophetic word, rhema word from the Holy Ghost. For behold, my people, it is time for you to become champions. I have called you to a higher level. I have called you to win. So many of you have not won because you don't think like winners, but I've given you instruction today to take you to the winner's circle. Now I want you to rise up, receive my word and become winners, become champions because I'm gonna use you to slay many enemies and I'm gonna use you to establish territories and I'm gonna use you to establish my word and my kingdom on earth. And your name shall be great. And I will give you a forever name that echoes down through time and eternity. And if you are faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life and cause you to sit in my throne with me and you will be a forever champion if you listen to me, says the spirit of the living God. Wow, 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 and wow. Look at that. Look at what the Holy Ghost said. The Holy Ghost said that God is calling us to that championship level. That means we got to think, speak, and work like a champion. And God is saying, if we listen to him, He's going to cause us to crush enemies, establish territories, establish his word and his kingdom. And we're going to get a forever name. We're going to get a name that doesn't fade. We're going to get a crown of life if we're faithful unto death. And we're going to be able to sit in Jesus' throne and reign and rule with him. Look at that. Why is that so important? Because anything God calls you to is not just for time. It's also for eternity. It's not just for this life. It's for the life to come. That's why people that reject God don't really understand what they're rejecting. God is not just giving, God does not just want to give you a blessing. God wants to make you a blessing. God does not just want to bless you in time. God wants to bless you in eternity. And God does not want you just to live. God wants to use your life 
to establish some things that are going to live on after you leave earth because his kingdom is the only eternal kingdom. In other words, the Roman Empire fell and Alexander the Great's empire fell. The great pharaohs of Egypt fell, but the Lord's kingdom still standing strong. So he's trying to get you to tap into something eternal. This is what I mean when I say this is why you have to take your daily quiet time with God seriously. Because if you are rejecting the word of the Lord, this is what you're turning your back on. Why would you do that? Okay. But God is calling us to that championship level and I'm going and I'm excited. Okay. And I've had some things open up in my life that the reason they opened up is because I was ready. I give him all the glory, but I understand now the training I had. Okay. Because it was getting me ready for the next thing. Okay. And so that's what I mean when I say uh, we have to listen to what the spirit of God said. It's time to come up to that championship level. So we're going to think like champions by getting mentors, getting around people that are living the way we want on that level. We're going to speak like champions. We're going to change our speech. We're going to say what God says. We're going to proclaim victory. We're going to talk about winning and we're going to work like champions. OK, all under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit only listens to Jesus and Jesus only listens to Father. And whatever Father says is what Jesus says. And whatever Jesus says, he tells the Holy Ghost and then the Holy Ghost tells us. And the Holy Ghost only says what Jesus says. That means we can't go wrong listening to the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? All right. One last thing before I close, those of you that are struggling right now, the reason that you're struggling is because the enemy has come against you and you haven't developed your faith to learn how to fight at that level. On a scale of one to 20, if you stay a baby Christian and you stay at faith level one, I stop by to tell you at some point in your life, the devil's gonna hit you at a faith level three or four. He gonna hit you two or three points higher than where you are and you're not gonna know what to do. That's why so many Christians get defeated and that's why so many Christians leave here early. God gave you time to build your faith and learn how to put on your armor, but you didn't take it seriously. And that's why you're struggling. Any area that you're struggling in, that's why you're struggling. Because God has given you time to build up your faith in that area and you didn't take it seriously. So what you need to do today is repent. Those of you watching me live on the broadcast or wherever this broadcast is going, you need to repent. You have not been taking your relationship with God seriously. You've been religious. You've been checking off boxes. Well, I listened to some word today. Listen to the word is just the first step. You got to believe the word and obey the word. Okay. God has been trying to train you and you haven't been receiving the training. That's why you're struggling and that's why you're losing. But now in 2021, it's a matter of life and death. Why you think so many people are dropping dead? Because the devil is out there. Now I say that not to make you afraid. The devil is out there. People are breathing out death in their breath. Curses and pestilence is in the land because judgment is in the land. It's out there. Now you can win and we're supposed to win, but you got to listen to the Lord. I say that every week. The Holy Ghost give me to say that every week because we're trying to save people's lives here. If you don't take that seriously, the devil going to take you out. Okay. You got to take your walk with God seriously. If you at a, if you're still a baby Christian, if you just got saved, of course you're a baby Christian. If you've been saved two years, five years, seven years, 10 years, you still had a baby level of faith, that's unacceptable. That's why you're struggling. How can you say that, Prophet Taylor? How many years you want your child to stay in first grade? I'm sorry, one year. That's why. You ain't got no business still baby, being a baby Christian. You've been saved 20 years. Okay? That means you haven't been listening to the Lord's leading. So today's the day to repent. Okay? Let me pray that prayer right quick. If this prayer applies to you, now if it don't apply to you, don't say it. If this prayer applies to you, say it after me, if it applies to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you to repent of not hearing your voice, of not listening to the voice of the Lord. I am now today turning from my own way and I'm rededicating my life to you to listen to you to believe you and to obey you. Father, I want to go to the winner circle, but I know I can't get there unless I listen to you, unless I obey you. So I'm recommitting myself to hearing you and obeying you. So please make your vision, please make your voice to me clear so I can do from this day forward what you're telling me to do 
so I can become a winner. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if that applied to you, pray that prayer and watch God begin to move in your life. And when he starts talking to you, listen, okay? All right, that's it for today. Praise God for that mighty prophetic word. I'm edified by that. I'm blessed by that. Uh, remember I tell you, I'm going to ask you to do one thing uh, every week to help me increase my reach. So uh, for the last couple of weeks, I've been saying the same thing. This week's the same. I want you to share this video. Many, 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 many believers need to hear this video. Many, many people need to hear this video because for far too long, we have not gotten into the champion circle. For far too long, we have not been winners. For far too long, we have not been at the level God wants us to, to be at. And you ain't got no business fighting the devil at a level one and you've been saved 20 years. You're supposed to be fighting Satan at a much higher level because you've been walking with God longer than you're supposed to be. So share this video in as many places as you can so that the, the call of the Spirit of God can go out to as many people as possible so that they might hear the word of God concerning champions. All right? All right. If you want to uh, bless me financially, a lot of people ask me, uh, can they contribute to my ministry? Yes, you can. I don't do what I do for money. I do what I do because the Lord uh, tells me to, but I'm putting my zeal in the chat. So if you want to uh, bless me financially, you can. And uh, right. So I will be here. Uh, man, this is last Sunday in April. April, gone. <laughs> so I will be here same time next week, next Sunday, which will be May 2nd. Same time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Amen. God bless. And remember, it's time for us to get into the championship circle.